When you look back, do you have people in your life where you think, I wish I would have never met them? I wish I never met her. I wish I never met him. I wish I never met all of them. Because if I hadn't met her, if I hadn't met him, I haven't, if I hadn't met all of them, my life would be better. I wouldn't have tried that. I wouldn't have gone there. I wouldn't have done that. Or maybe it's the opposite. If I hadn't met them, I would have tried that. I would have gone there. I would have done something looking back I wish I would have done. Now, to be clear, I think we assume this, but let's make sure we're on the same page. We are all accountable for our choices. If we get into a bad situation, someone else might have dragged us there, but we made decisions along the way that kind of put us in that place. So we're not trying to make excuses. But here's what I know, and this is true in my life, and it's true in your life as well. There are certain decisions that I have made that have put me in a situation where the bad choice was inevitable. If I'm being honest, if I'm put back in that situation again today, 10 out of 10 times, I will mess it back up. But to back it up even further, the reason why I got into those bad situations is because I was around that person. And so really the choice for me was, am I going to be influenced by that person or that group of people? Because if I'm going to be influenced by them, it will lead there, it will lead to that. That's why you and I have regrets that start with, if I had never been around her, if I'd never been around him, if I'd never been around them, that would not have happened. And so quick review. We're continuing in our wisdom series called Guardrails that we started last week. And our goal for this series is to implement guardrails in our lives so that we don't drive our life into a ditch. And a guardrail in driving prevents the worst case scenario. If you hit a guardrail, it causes a little bit of damage, but it stops you from driving over the edge or driving in oncoming traffic or driving into a ditch. So we're trying to ask in this series, what guardrails can I set up in different areas so I don't drive my life off a cliff? Because what we want to do and our goal is that we want our conscience to ping when we hit a guardrail. We don't want our conscience to ping when we're driving over the cliff because we all know that's too late. We want to hit a guardrail and for our conscience to say, wait, we're going the wrong direction. We need to turn around. We need a little course correction to go the right way. We want our conscience to stop us before it's too late. And so what we're doing is we're taking a series that Andy Stanley did called Guardrails and we're making it better because we're collective. And here's why. Here's why we're doing this series. A whole lot of the Bible is not about heaven and hell. A whole lot of the Bible is not about prayer. A whole lot of the Bible isn't even about God directly. It's all indirectly about God, but specifically like the character of God. It's not all about that. But a lot of the Bible is simply wisdom. What we believe is that God created us, that God wants us to live the best life possible, and he tells us the best way to live. And that's what we have in the wisdom of the Bible. And so what we do is we ask, what is the wise thing to do? And the wise thing to do in this series is to set up guardrails. And so today we're going to learn how to set up guardrails relationally and in our friendships so we don't drive our lives off a cliff. Because we've all met him, we've all met her, we've all met them, that if we hadn't met them, our life would be better. Let me give you a few examples. You've met people and I've met people that have had affairs in their marriage. And that can happen one of two ways. One way is you download an app and go have a random hookup. But the more common way is this. It's a friend, it's a neighbor, it's a coworker, maybe somebody at the gym and they're just friends. They just talk when they see each other, but eventually the talking turns to flirting. She laughs a little too much at a joke that isn't funny. He starts listening a little too eagerly to something that isn't overly interesting. And then one day he gives her a hug because she shares something personal. Maybe it's good news from work or maybe it's actually bad news about something that's going on in her family. Then they kind of go a little bit further and they go to lunch. And what's the line between a business lunch and a date? I'm not sure. But then he invites her to a happy hour and fast forward a couple of years and there are divorce proceedings and custody battles. Now here's my question. Where along the line did it become inappropriate? Where did they cross the line? Now here's my answer. I don't really know. But I do know based on where it ended, somewhere there needed to be a guardrail set up that warned them that they were getting off track and they needed a course correction. I think about addiction because this affects so many of the people we love, if not you yourself. I read an article recently about heroin addicts and how they got addicted to heroin. It's each person sharing their own story. And here's what everyone said who shared their story for the article. And this is how it began every single time. It was, my friend gave me. I was at a party. I was at a friend's house. I was hanging out with some people. 
And then the stories always progress from there. Not one of the stories of any of these heroin addicts started like this. I woke up one day and wanted to try heroin for the first time. That's not how it happens. It's, the stories are, it's with him, it's with her, I was with them, and before I knew it, I was an addict. Now think about dating. A lot of our stories go like this. I dated a person and they messed me up. I made some mistakes and I'm accountable for some of those mistakes, but if I hadn't dated that person, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have this wound. I wouldn't struggle in this way. And listen, where along the line did you make a mistake? I don't know. But I know that if you had guardrails, that wouldn't have happened. Somewhere you crossed the line, somewhere you drove off a cliff. And if you had a guardrail, there might still be some damage, but because there wasn't one at all, you drove your life off the edge. I think about faith. A lot of us who are followers of Jesus have heard this story before. We see somebody who gets introduced to Jesus, maybe at collective, and they fall in love with him. They get baptized, they serve, they give, they connect, they start to read their Bible every day, they go on mission trips. They're sold out and Jesus has made their life better and is continuing to make their life better and they're making a huge impact for him. But somewhere along the line, they start hanging out with a group of people that aren't about Jesus. And maybe that group of people absolutely opposes Jesus, which actually isn't really likely. They just don't talk about faith. They don't talk about what the Bible teaches. They don't talk about Jesus. They don't talk about anything spiritual. Instead, they talk about movies and music and everything else. And what happens over time is that person who is so into Jesus begins to drift. They get off track. They begin to get into other things besides church, other things besides the Bible, other things besides making an impact so people can tangibly see Jesus' love, other things besides Jesus himself. And you fast forward two, five, ten years down the road, and they wake up one day and say, I don't think I believe anymore. Why? Well, I don't know when it happened, but I know that somewhere along the line, they started following their friends instead of Jesus, and their friends led them off a cliff. And so today we're asking, how do we create guardrails for our relationships? How can we set up guardrails that will keep us on the path that God says is best for us to live, especially when it comes to our friendships and our relationships? And today we're gonna learn from the book of Proverbs. And Proverbs is probably one of my favorite books of the Bible because it's full of wisdom and it's really easy to follow and really easy to understand. In fact, oftentimes people will come up to me and they'll say that they're new to reading the Bible and they want to start reading it on their own. And I always tell them, don't start at the beginning, but start one with the biographies of Jesus. Start with the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because there you get to learn who Jesus is. You get to see his miracles, his teaching, his death, burial, and resurrection. You get to truly see how much he loves and cares for people. But the next thing I'll tell people is to read Proverbs. It's full of very practical wisdom that will help you with your marriage It'll help you with money. It'll help you with your business. It'll help you with the things that you love. It'll help you with hobbies, all of it. And so that's where we're going to be today. We're going to be in Proverbs 12. And this is what it says in verse 26. The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Now, this is just saying in a different way what we talked about in our Bad Blood series last fall. Show me your friends, and I will show you your future. If you show me the people around you, I can make a pretty good guess about the path that you're headed on, right? Your friends and your family can see that based on the people that you spend the majority of your time with. Jim Rohn, who was an entrepreneur and a business guru, said that we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. If that were the case, would you like that average? If you wrote out the good and bad characteristics of the five people you spend the most time with, would you be surrounded by the right people? And what's really important when he says that, he's not saying you're surrounded by the five people that you want to be around, right? He's not saying choose five people and those end up being the people that you're around. He's saying the five people that you spend the most time with, and sometimes that's family, sometimes it's friends, but sometimes it's people at work. The five people you spend the most time with are what you end up being. You tend to be more like those people. So the question is, are you surrounded by the right people? Are they helping you be a better spouse? Are they helping you be a better parent, a better friend, a better follower of Jesus, or are they leading you astray? Are they leading you down a path away from the person that you want to be? And more importantly, away from the person that God created you to be. That's why the scripture talks about the way. Which way are you going? Have you ever noticed lately, this is a little bit of soapbox of mine, but we're going to do it, that uh, it's actually culturally acceptable now to blame your phone on being late. Like, like this, and it's daylight savings time, so a lot of you guys were like, and that was my excuse, and not anymore. And I get that. It's just a coincidence that it's daylight savings time. 
But uh, this just might be me, but it kills me when, when I find out there are people that show up late to appointments or late to a friend's house or late to a party and they walk in and they're like, sorry guys, my phone. And everyone kind of understands what excuse they're trying to make. Right? People are like, it's cool, we get it, like the phone, it's a problem. This drives me insane. <laughs> a few weeks ago, Ray and I were actually meeting some people for lunch who were from out of town. And before they arrived, we sent them the address with a link to Google Maps in it. The night before we hung out, I actually told them, like, this is where we're going to be, don't show up late. The next day, they were already 15 minutes late when I called them to see what was going on. And their response was to blame Google Maps on their phone. But here's the thing. Even if Google Maps did mess up, they didn't even leave on time. They wouldn't even have made it on time anyways, but instead of taking responsibility, they blame their phones. And so Proverbs 12 says, the way of the wicked leads them astray. And there's things that we oftentimes are led astray, and so we blame our phone, right? We say, that's the way, that's what got us in trouble. Because people who end up doing dumb things tend to blame the way. They say, my job, my parents, my spouse, my school, my phone, my circumstances led me astray. And this is what happens when you don't have guardrails. What ends up happening is you just fall into a certain lifestyle, you fall into choices, you fall into relationships, and you say, it's not my fault. But realistically, that's a path that you walked down. And sometimes you chose that path, and sometimes you didn't. Sometimes it's active, and sometimes that's passive. And here's what's really interesting. Neuroscience is actually showing how the people around us affect us on a brainwave level. I want to read a quote from a neuroscientist named Moran Cerf, and here's what he said. The more we study engagement, meaning people being around each other, we see time and time again that just sitting next to certain people actually aligns your brain with them. And the example they gave in the story I read was, if you simply sit next to a stranger on the subway, someone you don't even know, your brainwaves start acting the same. He said, if you want to minim or maximize happiness and minimize stress, which I'll take that. I'd love to maximize my happiness and minimize stress. He says, they should, people should build a life that requires fewer, fewer decisions by surrounding themselves with people who embody traits they prefer. Saying, so surround yourself with people who live the life that you look up to, that you want to live. But let me translate this for you. So this is what it says. Scientists have proven that you, if you are just around people, you will begin to think like them, whether you want to or not. Over time, you will naturally pick up their attitudes and behaviors. And that's true in good ways, and it's true in bad ways as well. And so you have a choice. You get to choose who you spend time with. You get to choose who you want to be like. You can actively surround yourself with the right people. You legitimately, and this is insane, you legitimately get to choose who you want your brain waves to sync up with. Like that's a reality that we have in our life. You can choose your friends carefully, or you can allow other people to make an impact on your attitudes and behaviors, even though you're not trying to have that happen. Even though you're just sitting next to someone, you're just working with someone, you're just spending time with someone passively. I think that's why it's so important that this verse in Proverbs uses the word choose. It says, the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. The righteous choose. The righteous choose their friends, the wicked don't. Why? Because the righteous are proactive, because the righteous put up guardrails. See, today what we're talking about is something that you choose. No one can put up these guardrails for you. Very rarely can anyone else put up a healthy guardrail for you. And it goes back to what we talked about last week. Guardrails are personal. I need guardrails that you don't need. And you need guardrails that I don't need. You wouldn't even know what guardrails I need in my life. And so here's what I know, and neuroscience confirms it, and this is super simple but the people around you impact you. The people that you spend time with impact you. The people that you see all the time, that you talk to, your family, your friends, your workers, the people that you just kind of bump into on a regular basis, they impact you. And this is what it looks like. If you date someone that thinks that premarital sex is beneficial for your marriage, you will begin to think that. If you're around people that think affairs are an acceptable thing to do when your marriage is on the rocks, you will consider that. If you hang out with people who go into debt to impress others, you will start shopping for things you don't need. And the opposite of that is true as well. If you're around people who hate debt and badmouth debt, you will start to pay it off sooner. We're seeing this right now. We have a class called FPU that's on Monday nights and it's 20 people that are in there that have an incredible amount of debt that they're trying to work through. And the thing is, they're crushing it. They're doing such a good job because they're surrounded by other people who are saying, let's fight this together. 
right? And there are people who said before they got in that class, they struggled because they felt like they were the only one trying to do this, right? They were the only person trying to pay off debt. And we surrounded them with other people who are doing it and they're seeing so much success. If you're around people who talk about what they're learning in the Bible and a verse that's inspiring them and how God is speaking to them through scripture, you will prioritize reading your Bible every day. If you're around people who are constantly asking, how can I be a godlier parent and bring grace and truth into my child and raise them up and send them out into the world, you will start to ask the same question. If you're around people who focus on taking care of themselves physically and spiritually and mentally and emotionally, you will start to focus on that as well. And again, the key word here is choose. You choose who you spend time with. You choose the impact of that. 196 times in scripture, the word choose or choice is used because God gives you the ability to choose. Deuteronomy 30 says, choose life. Joshua 24 says, choose whom you will serve. Proverbs 8 says, choose God's instruction. 2 Kings 18 says, choose life instead of death. Proverbs 22 says, choose a good reputation. And Proverbs 12 says, the righteous choose. And so the question today is, will you choose to have healthy guardrails around your relationships and your friendships? Don't be passive. Don't, you can't be passive. It still impacts you whether or not you want it to. You can't be passive. Don't let the way choose you because the righteous choose for themselves. We say this all the time. You are ridiculously in control of your life. You are in control of the decisions that you make. You are control, in control of the friendships that you have, the relationships that you have, the direction that your life is going. But you can actively choose that path or you can let it happen to you. Now, let's talk about the word righteous for a second. Because oftentimes you hear that word and it sounds like we're saying self-righteous. Like you can't hang out with me because you're too good for me. And what we're talking about today can come off as being and sounding judgmental. It can sound condemning. And I know some of you are thinking, Michael, aren't you saying that when I leave today, I need to stop being friends with certain people? Isn't this everything we don't like about religion? Isn't this the kind of attitude that pushed a bunch of us away from church years ago and we came to collective with trepidation? Because I've heard stories and you've heard stories of people that didn't dress the right way or talk the right way, or had a child when they weren't married, or got divorced, or asked too many questions, and some religious leader said, you can't be here. Isn't this the arrogance exactly, isn't this arrogance exactly what Jesus railed against as people set up false boundaries and judge people by them? And so if you're thinking that, I'm glad you asked. Jesus does bash people who make it hard to get to God. And he does it ruthlessly. He doesn't stop. It's a part of his ministry. And he doesn't apologize for it. In fact, that's one of my favorite things about Jesus. But what we are talking about today and in this entire series is not, I'm going to tell you what to do because I know what's best for you. I don't know what's best for you. This series is all about, I know me and here's what's best for me and this is what I have to do. And the easiest example that I know you agree with is if you know or have anyone in your life that's a healthy alcoholic, meaning someone who is self-aware, someone who's in recovery. Because a healthy al alcoholic doesn't say, you should never drink again and you can't go into bars, and you can't go into parties like that. The healthy alcoholic says, I know me, and I can never drink again, and I can't go to parties like that, and I can't go to that bar because I know me. In fact, I studied this word righteous because I wanted to make sure that I got it right, and one of the translations in the Bible that I absolutely love says this. It says, righteous means one who doesn't fall, and I love that. It doesn't mean that you're arrogant, it doesn't mean you are better or condemning or judgmental. All it means is that I have tripped and fallen on my face before and I don't want that to happen again. And so I'm gonna live my life in such a way where I don't fall. I know for me personally, that's what I want. I, I wanna be the one who doesn't fall because I've fallen before and it hurts and it takes a long time to recover from. But the reality with all this is I know I will fall again. I'm not perfect. You will fall again, you're not perfect. And because of that, there's grace. Because of that, Jesus offers forgiveness. Because of that, Jesus offers second chances. Even in our pursuit of righteousness, we will crash every once in a while, some more often than others. And that's why the goal of this series isn't to be perfect, but to crash a little less often. And guardrails help us do that. Choosing our friends wisely helps us do that. Asking ourselves what is the wise thing to do will help us do that. But the good news is when we fall, which, which we will, Jesus will offer grace. He will pick us back up, he will dust us off, and he will tell, tell us to try again. 
And so the thing is, while we pursue righteousness, we also get to experience grace. And so here's what I wanna do. I always try to make sermons practical, so I'm gonna put up some statements on the screen. And I think you should write them down or take pictures of them because my hope is that one or maybe a few of them will prompt something inside you to set up guardrails in your relationships. Because we believe that at Collective that God is speaking to you, that you're here for a reason, that he's trying to push you in a certain direction. And he's saying, in this area of your life, here's how he wants to guide you. So I'm gonna give you all five uh, and, and hopefully a few of them will help you set up a healthy guardrail in your relationship. So I, I encourage you to write it down, take a picture, whatever you need to kind of wrestle with these ideas. So guardrail number one, you need a guardrail when you realize that your core group is moving away from where you want to be moving. Now this is a process and some of you may not notice this at first, but there comes a point where you realize that you should not be doing what you are doing or going where you are going and that should affect you. Like the group of people that you walk with, that you spend time with, are moving in a different direction away from where you want to be as a spouse, as a friend, as a follower of Jesus. And when you realize that, that's when you have to put up a guardrail in your life. When you realize that, that's God speaking to you. He's saying, hold on one second. Guardrail number two. You need a guardrail when you catch yourself thinking, I will go, but I won't participate. Now, here's what that sounds like. I'll go to that party where I know there's drugs and alcohol, but... I'll go on that work trip where all, the only thing my coworkers are talking about is hitting up all the strip clubs in Vegas, but I have a group of friends that love to bash Christians, but they're so fun to hang out with, even though they do that, and they invited me to go, and I will, but. And so what you're saying is, I'm going to go, but I'm not gonna participate, and the reality is that's hard. And so what I'm saying is, that doesn't mean don't go. What I'm saying is you have to put up guardrails, because when you decide to go into something where you know bad things can happen, if you don't have guardrails, bad things will happen. So you may need a guardrail. Number three, you need a guardrail when you want to compromise. Now here's my opinion. We talk about peer pressure a lot in society, especially with teenagers. But my experience, even with talking with other people, is that peer pressure is real, but it's not nearly as big of a deal as self-pressure. Because peer pressure is when someone else is forcing you to do something, but self-pressure is more common. And this is what it looks like. Someone asks us to do something or invites us to do something and we create a narrative in our head that we have no way of verifying if it's true, right? We talked about this last summer with the Chatterbox series. There's this voice inside of our head that creates this narrative that, that tells us that we're wrong, that something bad's gonna happen and we don't even know if it's real. And so what we're doing is we're just making things up and we're thinking and feeling about their motive, right? We try to decide what's the reason for them inviting us to do these things. But then we begin to think if I say no, if I don't play along, if I don't go along, then what I'm doing will lead to them alienating me as a friend or rejecting me as their friend or talking about me behind my back. But the reality is they didn't give any indication that they will do that. And I'm just in my own head and I'm putting self-pressure on myself. And so when I feel pressure to compromise, or that's peer pressure or even self-pressure, I need to recognize that I'm hitting a guardrail. I need to realize that even though I haven't done anything wrong, I'm heading in a direction that I don't wanna go in because I'm compromising who I am or I'm allowing someone else to do that for me. And if you do that, you might need a guardrail. Number four, and I wanted to have something on social media in here, and this is what it is. Uh, you need a guardrail when you can't show your feed to those closest to you. Yeah, that stings a little bit, doesn't it? If you can't scroll through everything on Instagram with your spouse sitting next to you, if you can't show them the comments you make, the profiles that you follow, the Instagram stories that you watch, or the follow requests that you don't respond to but keep in your queue on Instagram, you need a guardrail. Whatever social media you use, Facebook, Twitter, or Snapchat, any of them, if you won't let your spouse or your accountability partner or your best friend, whoever it is, whoever's pushing you to be a better person, whoever's pushing you toward Jesus, if you won't let them look over your shoulder at what you are commenting on and what you're reading and at the pictures that you're seeing, you need a guardrail. Number five is this, you need a guardrail when you start thinking about your excuse while you're doing it. We've all been there. You're doing something that you shouldn't be doing and you're already thinking about what you're going to say when you get caught. I found that by accident. That was my first time. I got lost. I didn't know it was that expensive. I didn't know where that click would lead. You already make an excuse. And if you're doing that, you need a guardrail because alarm bells should be going off in your head. And there are so many people in this room that would pay a ton of money if they could go back in time and never meet that person or that group of people. Because when they formed a relationship with that person or that group of people, their life was led off a cliff. But the reality is, and the sad thing is, with a lot of our pain is we can't go back. 
We can't go back to fix the situation in our past. We can only learn from it and create guardrails for the future. So the question is, will you set up relational guardrails now that will help you in your current relationships and your future relationships? Here's the thing about today's sermon. I think it's really easy to agree with, and that's fine, and that's a good thing. It isn't controversial. I don't think I said anything that you won't agree with. It's not a punch you in the gut or emotional sermon. But here's our temptation when we hear sermons that are easy to agree with. We begin to think, I wish that person was here, right? We begin to think they need to hear this. We begin to think I'm going to send them the podcast. What ends up happening is we don't really apply it to ourselves. So I'm gonna give you some homework because I want you to apply this to yourself. And and this is gonna be easy homework. Uh, It'll be fun homework if you actually do it. And it's actually gonna be healthy homework. And so sometimes it's better and easier to do the positive thing than to avoid doing the negative thing. So I wanna challenge you to do the positive thing. I want you to think of one person or one group of people who have led you in the right direction. Uh, People who have picked you up when you've fallen on your face or crashed into a ditch. And I want you to do two things. First, I want you to reach out to them and let them know that you appreciate them and that they've led you in the right direction. Reach out to those people who are helping you be a better follower of Jesus. Reach out to those people who are encouraging you in your faith. Reach out to those people who are helping you be a better husband or a better friend, a better boyfriend, whatever it is. Reach out to those people and let them know that you appreciate them. The second thing is this. I want you to put something on your calendar to spend time with them. Now, it doesn't have to be some deep spiritual thing like getting together for a Bible study or praying together, and maybe it is, and if you want to do that, that's great. But it could be just going out to grab lunch or if they're far away, a phone call, coffee. Either way, I want you to reach out and spend some time with somebody who makes you better. Intentionally put that time into your week to spend time with people who are leading you on the right direction and leading you down the right path. And intentionally say that you're not gonna be passive about your friendships. Intentionally say that you're not gonna let life happen to you. Intentionally say that you're going to choose to spend time with someone who makes you who God wants you to be. That's gonna be your homework. I can guarantee you if you do that, not only the person on the other end of that will feel encouraged, but you will be as well. And you're also allowing them to be in that space. You're putting them in that five if they're not already there. And you're saying, impact me, pour into my life, help me be a better version of me. Now, if you don't think you have anyone like that, the good news is you can choose to find someone to be that person in your life. This is why we constantly encourage people that go to collective to not just attend on Sundays, but to join a collective during the week or join the team and serve here on Sunday mornings. Because I can guarantee you that at least half the people who hear this sermon this week will reach out to someone in this church. I can guarantee you there are people here that the person that's pushing them right now and encouraging them most right now are friends and and family, people maybe they've known for a little bit, but really it's people they just met in this church. And so if you don't have a person or people that will push you to be the person God wants you to be, find someone right? Put yourself in a place where those people exist. And listen, I know I'm biased, but I think this is the best place to find it. You can use your connection card or head out to the iPads to take that step. But ultimately what's important is you can choose to put yourself in a place where those people exist, where those relationships can begin and where those relationships can become a reality. Now I want to read one more proverb today before we finish. And this is Proverbs 18, 24. This is what it says. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, which we all fully understand. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now listen to me. The reason why your life is in a ditch is not fully because you have the wrong friends. The ultimate reason your life is in a ditch is because you chose not to follow God and your bad relationships are a byproduct of that. You chose to do things your own way, and that is where it ended up. You chose to put your own rules in your own life. You chose to find people on your own, and eventually they led you down the wrong path. But the reason why is because you didn't put God first. Unfortunately for us, Jesus didn't just bash others from preventing people from coming to God. He made a way to God. He died on a cross so that we could be connected to God. So if you just trust in him, your life will get better. And ultimately, you'll have a connection to God that you were designed to have, and your life will be changed forever. But if you keep running your life into a ditch, you definitely need to find new friends. But you also need something more than that. You need Jesus. You need someone who will guide you into eternity. And it's the person who designed you. It's the person who died for you. I want to leave us all with this. Choose wisely. 
Choose wisely. It's your choice. You get to choose what relationships you have. You get to choose the people that influence your life. You get to choose the people who influence and impact your family. Choose wisely. Live like one who doesn't want to fall. And the thing is, uh, what's good about that is we've fallen in the past, right? And that can teach us what guardrails and, and what relationships we need to have for the future so that we can pursue righteousness. You're not a victim of your relationships. You're in charge, but it's your choice. The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. What will you choose in your relationships? Let's pray. God, um, help, us, help us to have the right relationships. God, help us to find the right five. Um, God, the right five people that push us to be better. Better husbands, better, better parents, better employees, um, better followers of you, um, better at eliminating debt. God, God, put us in a place where we can find those five people that will lead us on the right path, that will help us when we start to veer off course. God, help us find the right people that won't lead us astray. God, I pray this week um, that we can ask what's the wise thing to do in our relationships. God, that we can put up guardrails to protect ourselves from future pain. God, that we can put things in place to make sure that we're on the right path and making the right decisions and see ultimately, God, um, what can happen when we have the right relationships. God, uh, thank you so much that even as we try to put guardrails in our life, uh, even as we pursue righteousness, God, we, we will fail. God, we'll fall short, but you still love us. You still offer us grace. So God, as we try to put these guardrails in place uh, and we fail and we fall short and we mess up, um, God, thank you that you pick us back up again and keep pushing us forward. God, thank you and we love you and pray these things in your name.